it's 7 o'clock, so we're going to go ahead and get started. For the regulars, I'm Tiffany, and it's good to see you back here again for our Tuesday lecture. I'm excited to have Dr. Miles come and speak. Uh, I know Dr. Miles very well. We've been friends for five years now, five, five or six years in Fairbanks, and so uh, I roped him into doing this. I kind of use the guilt thing. No, I'm just uh, well, let me tell you a little bit about Dr. Miles. So he received his Bachelor of Arts in Biology from the State University of New York at Buffalo. He graduated from the University of Southern California in Los Angeles with his medical doctor. He completed his family practice residency at the University of California at Los Angeles, and he went to work with the National Health Service Division of the U.S. Public Health Service in Ennis, Montana. He decided to further his career in women's health, and he completed an OBGYN residency with Kaiser Permanente Hospital at Santa Clara, California. Dr. Miles practiced both family medicine and OBGYN from 92 to 2008 in Great Falls, Montana, and he continues to practice OBGYN at the University Women's Health in Fairbanks. When he's not practicing medicine, Dr. Miles stays very active, getting a healthy dose of the outdoors where he mightily enjoys hunting and fishing, Nordic and alpine skiing, and running. So please help me welcome Dr. Miles. <laughs> well, nice to see everybody today. Thanks, thanks for coming. <clears throat> and uh, as we can see here, <clears throat> excuse me, um, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. And I think that, you know, is you know, just kind of a common sense. We all have heard that phrase, and yet it's one of those kind of time-honored, common sense uh, things that actually is true, you know. Uh, and I'd like to talk tonight about several things, you know. My uh, specialty interest, if you will, is in fact women. Uh, I'm, you know, a full-service OBGYN, including still delivering and, you know, gamut of women's surgery. However, I think more than some other offices, I also have maintained an interest in sort of primary care for women. Um, there's only a couple of odd, oddball sort of things I do still treat men for, but mostly I have a woman's practice, and we do a lot of primary care. Um, and so I do have an interest in that, and I think it's a very important, uh, very important part of our lives to basically try to stay out of my office if, in fact, we can. <laughs> and... Um, and I'm here to hopefully impart some, uh, some you know, pearls about that at this point. With that said, in my background, I am also happy to see several men here uh, for several reasons. Number one, some of the things we are going to talk about tonight are, in fact, they're sex, you know, independent. I mean, it doesn't, doesn't matter. They're gender independent. So, and the other thing is, is that especially, you know, if people are married or have a significant other, it's a team approach to your health. I mean, uh, if one or each are cooking or, you know, time and how you spend your time together, it, it does become a team approach. So, so it's actually, I'm glad, to, I'm glad to see you guys here too. You know, I'm going to start with just some, some generalities. And again, it sort of goes along with this uh, ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. In other words, common sense, you know. Basically, they're sort of miscellaneous tips, if you will, of how we can maintain our health. And when we're talking about maintaining our health, we're, we're trying to basically, there are unavoidable things which are going to occur with aging. Um, that what we're trying to do, though, is we're actually trying to you know, prevent things that are preventable, but also enter all stages of our life in the most productive ways that we can for ourselves, you know, to stay active and enjoy the things we like to do. So what we're looking at is really, as a given, just maintaining sort of regular, again, common sense health, having regular dental exams, eye exams, medical exams. And I will say the, the women are usually much better at the, uh, at least the medical exam part of that. And you know, it's sort of the, uh, how we're raised and things like female exams, pap smears, mammograms, these are things which you know, are uh, really, uh, you know, things which are very public health sort of uh, movements that have been very successful. And, and like I say, I myself, especially when I was in family practice, would, would definitely see, you know, women more involved than men. We see that, and there's genetic, you know, sort of reasons too, but the average lifespan of a woman in the United States
United States now is about 84 years old, compared to men somewhere in the 70s. And some of that might be beyond our control, but I think some of it is also with some of these uh, topics we're gonna discuss. So how do we go about and actually, like I say, common sense, stay healthy? Uh, I see one of my friends here is a dietitian, and my wife here is here too, by the way, so this is the team approach. And uh, eating healthy is the first thing I would uh, want to bring up. And again, there's common sense things with that. We're not talking about crazy diets that are advertised, you see. You know, we're talking about basically decreasing the amount of calories we take to a reasonable amount, decreasing the amount of fat in our diets, which will unavoidably decrease calories. Uh, <clears throat> calories pound for pound, ounce for ounce, or gram for gram, however you want to however you want to look at it, fat has more than twice the number of calories for an equal amount of a carbohydrate, for example. So decreasing the fat in our diets is important for numerous reasons, some of which we'll go through a little bit more later. Decreasing salt, decreasing sugar intake. Again, none of these are going to be revelations to anybody here, but in fact they are things that aren't really occurring as a whole, especially in you know our sort of affluent Western society. In addition to diet, regular physical activity, regular exercise. And we're, you know, again, you, you, you vary this as to where you are in your life, but just a regular activity. They, what we're looking at is usually there are guidelines, you know, numerous guidelines, but looking to of some sort of aerobic regular activity of about 150 minutes a week. And, you know, people can do the math as to what that is. Uh, for cardiovascular health, interestingly enough, uh, I mean, the, it's, there's a minimal amount actually necessary, like 20 minutes, three times a week, believe it or not, of a aerobic activity, just like vigorous walking, for example, or swimming, uh, running or jogging in people who are so inclined. Just 20 minutes, three times a week, believe it or not, has been proven to help with decreasing your cholesterol and helping with, you know, your heart health and blood vessels. So, so are people hearing me now? Is it a little bit better to, okay, good. In addition, and this is important, especially when men and women both get above the age of 40, is to introduce some strength training as well. And, you know, they, they talk about like two days of strength training a week multiple repetitions of light weights. You know, you're not gonna become, you know, Schwarzenegger here, you know. You just wanna make sure that you get your muscles built, and your bone, that'll help with bone health. So those things with, uh, with exercise, and exercise, again, is hand in hand with, with diet. And again, I, I, have to, I have to say, in our modern society, and in some ways, I'm almost frightened to say, in our, in our younger generations, meaning kids and teenagers and that, these are really becoming kind of unusual because exercise also is very indirect. You know, I talked about aerobic exercise a little bit, weight training, but in reality, things like taking the stairs instead of an elevator, you know, walking to the store, you know, not parking right next to the store in a parking lot. You know, and again, if you, a person has physical impairments or some mobility issues, you vary that. But even in that instance, you're just pushing the envelope in a safe way a little bit. Um, these are all important things and very easy ways to keep fit. Maintaining what they call a normal BMI, which stands for a body mass index. And that varies a little bit uh, with age, but, in re but the overall <clears throat> range is about 18 and a half to 24. And that's calculated by weight and height. Um, I'm not going to get into the big details about that, but over 25 is considered, 25 to 30 of that number is considered overweight, over 30 obese, over 35 of that number starting to get almost, well, more obese. And over 40, 50-ish, you're looking at what they call morbid obesity, where the weight actually is pretty much proven to be adverse have an adverse effect on your health. So keeping that weight in within that range is important. Not really very low, it's, it's interesting. You know, some people might say, well, what if it's real low? You know, for general population, if in fact maybe it's a little lower than that 18 and a half, 
you might be good. But actually, studies have found, a lot, believe it or not, people are sometimes keeping it below that 18 by smoking. <laughs> and uh, so uh, it just seems that statistically, the majority of people with those real low BMIs, uh, especially women, and are actually smokers. And so it's that obviously negatively impacts, you know. And that brings up into a uh, very simple, do not smoke. You know, do not smoke. I'll mention it again later. I mean, if you do smoke, quit. And if you don't smoke, don't start. I mean, that's, uh, you know, the Surgeon's General report on smoking came out in the early 1960s. I mean, suspicions about lately leading up to that were even into, you know, starting in the late 40s even. So this, this isn't new information. This is just common sense. And yet again, it's, it's very, very important to always keep it in mind. Limiting alcohol consumption. Uh, through on a daily basis, <clears throat> you know, um, and what that means in practicality is trying to make, uh, trying to consume no more than 12 ounces of beer a day, no more than five ounces of wine, and no more than one and a half ounces of hard liquor, which might be you know within a either by itself or in a mixed drink. Uh, and it's interesting, you know, they again they have polled uh, people who are 100, 105 years old and such. And, very interesting. Consistently, they, I mean, they don't totally eliminate alcohol consumption, but it's very interesting. There are many times somewhere within that range. So, very common sense again do not use street illegal drugs, sharing needles. I mean, uh, you know, that goes beyond the, uh, it goes beyond the young, meaning teenagers, too. I, it, it took me a while to figure this out. I started seeing in the newspaper methamphetamine dealers who were in their 60s. Well, if you think about it, those were people who were right younger in the height of the drug years of the 60s and 70s. So, I mean, again, it's, it's apropos to all ages, really, again, you know. Um, street drugs, sharing needles, these are things which are going to work against a healthy lifestyle. And then, you know, we have some more, more specific things, more medication-oriented, if you will. Uh, in particular, uh, this has been, some of these are, are, in fact, more proven for certain genders, but between the ages of 55 and 79, uh, consider taking one aspirin a day, unless you have problems, which would otherwise, you know, uh, be a problem for that, like peptic ulcer disease or allergies. And there's even evidence to show that even just every other day, it gets to be a little harder to remember that, but if you have a pill organizer, even just one adult aspirin every other day actually has a good effect. Uh, so, and they sell all these fancy ones, you know, the 81 milligram and this and that. And the reality of it is get the cheapest generic plain aspirin you can get. And just, that works just fine. Uh, with women, and there's a little bit more controversy maybe with this, and I'm sure some might raise their eyebrows, but, you know, hormone replacement therapy uh, in, uh, you know, as a whole, it has, interestingly enough, if maintained only for five years after the menopause, been shown to prolong life. And again, there's, you know, debate on that. The big debate started more or less in the early 90s, and there's a lot of People who are interested in statistics will banter back and forth uh, about things, but the reality of it is that they might, they might, these were probably overused at one time uh, with, with more reasonable usage. They are, there is data to show that they in fact do, for women obviously, uh, do prolong, prolong lifespan. Use of sunscreens, and these are all, you know, like I say, basic things. Paying attention to your skin. Uh, moles, uh, you know, changing in moles, new appearance of moles. These are all important things. And I guess these are all sort of things that maybe no one, it's probably not a surprise to many people, uh, but these are all common sense, if you will, things, and some of which maybe are a little bit more common sense, their medical knowledge that are very important. And part of, one of the handouts I did get as well is uh, an outline on the CDC recommended adult immunization schedule. And that's the last thing I would like to touch on as far as just the generality is immunizations do in fact uh, go to, even for adults, uh, go to uh, 
you know, prolonged, prolonged life. One of the biggest examples is obviously the shingles vaccine. I mean, you know, shingles in and of itself can be a miserable affliction, but it can actually be more than that. It can be cause blindness, you know, cause you know, debil debilitation that leads to other things like blood clots and whatnot. So uh, and there's a whole, and I did give you a handout regarding the immunizations, which you can refer to and talk to uh, talk to your providers. And uh, the pharmacists have sort of really taken off with immunizations too, and have been given the mandate, uh, you know, to, to be able to do so, which, which, you know, I think most of them actually do a pretty good job with it, you know, so. So with all of that said, let's get into some more specifics now with respect to guidelines, suggested guidelines, you know, for that help us with health screening. And a lot of these guidelines, uh, they change over the years. I mean, a lot of them have come about, you know, with years of experience. Some of them, most of them actually come about from uh, the government, governmental agencies, you know, they come from studies sponsored by the government. Then there's other professional organizations like my specialty organization, for example, speaks on mammograms and pap smears and, and there was even conflicting recommendations. So I've kind of done, what I'm gonna do is like a bit of a summary as far as what, and I'll, you know, if there's variations in those recommendations, I'll try to point them out. And this in particular is, is as well, I mean, obviously some of them like pap smear and mammogram, these are, these are female, you know, gender specific. But this in particular is again where I'm glad some men are here and share this with your, your spouses and such because a lot of these guidelines are, are irrespective of gender. So, so let's go on into that, see what we can do here, see if I can work this thing out. Here. There we go. <clears throat> so blood lipids, and lipids are cholesterol and triglycerides, and then they break the cholesterol down. But lipid screening, and oh, there is one other thing I do wanna, I do wanna make a point on. When we talk about screening, there's a difference between screening and, you know, and following treatment. In other words, what we're talking about here, the, the thrust of this, and I'll make, you know, point out some of the exceptions as we go, and this is one of them actually. We're talking about your basic healthy individual with no underlying medical problems. They're not already being treated for something like this. Uh, and we're actually even assuming we're not even including people who have strong family histories. We're, we're talking about your average Joe and Jane, basically, who are, you know, of these age brackets and don't have any afflictions or increased risk for that based on family, genetics, et cetera. So that's an important point to remember when we're talking about this, because these vary tremendously for people, for example, who already have an elevated cholesterol or whatever. So <clears throat> blood lipids, when should we start screening? This has kind of gone down over the years, the age that they've suggested. And uh, I myself remember even in the 80s, they were, it was quite a bit higher than this. Um, but they're actually suggesting across the board Across the board, all, all individuals starting screening at 20 years old. And it's very interesting in that plaques from cholesterol, which can propagate and be problems, actually they've documented that they begin as early as nine or 10 years old in at least Western, you know, Western society uh, individuals. So starting screening at, at, at 20, now if in fact that's normal, and I see this all the time, you know, well, I want my cholesterol checked, you know, every year. Well. The reality of it is that you probably, that's you really, if they're normal, at least for some period of time in that individual's life, every five years is sufficient. And like I say, there's debates on this and different people, you know, and as there are even debates on the normals, but as a general rule of thumb, this is a good guideline uh, to keep in mind for ourselves as well as, you know, if you have grandkids, kids, you know, et cetera. Lung cancer screening. Before I even get into that, I'll repeat again. Don't smoke, and if you do, quit. It's very common sense. There's an interesting statistic, too. <clears throat> I think it's gotten less and less now because the active, really hardcore smokers nowadays are sort of a real addicted group. I mean, even 20 years ago, more people were more inclined to stop. But at that time, at least 20, 
so years ago, 10% of people, if a physician told them, looked them in the eye and said, stop smoking, 10% of people would stop smoking. I think that's probably not as true nowadays because like they were talking at a real addicted group. So basically, don't start. And even in this day and age, I have to tell you, and, and women more than men, <laughs> interestingly enough, I, I have, you know, 24-year-old women will come in and say, gosh, yeah, I'm embarrassed to say, you know, in the last year I've started smoking, you know, they're hanging out with friends in a bar, and it just all of a sudden, the next thing you know, they're smoking a half pack a day. I mean, it's it still occurs. It's kind of interesting. So, so don't start. Now, <clears throat> there are actually lung cancer screening uh, guidelines. This, this was, you know, when I put together these talks, you know, God knows I, <laughs> I don't know everything there is about medicine in general or even screening. And this is an example. This, this was a true education for me. I, uh, I didn't really realize that the lung cancer screening guidelines had been worked out to this extent. So this was a learning experience for me. When we talk about smoking, we talk about pack year histories. That's very easy. You take the number of years that a person has smoked and you sort of the average number of packs per day. So if somebody smokes a pack a day for 30 years, they have a 30 pack year history of smoking. And that's what these are based on. If a person is a current smoker and they have a 30 pack year history, or if they're a 30 pack year, have a 30 pack year history prior of smoking, but they have, it's been less than 15 years that they've stopped, and if they're between the ages of 55 and 80, it's actually recommended that they get a low dose chest CAT scan, not an x-ray, but an actual CAT scan until they've achieved that 15 years of no smoking, you know, goal. It's kind of interesting to me. I, I didn't realize, I do have patients come in asking me for the CAT scans, and I knew that they were a better means of detecting lung cancer, but I didn't really, myself, until this talk, preparation, know that there was an actual recommendation for that. So. It's kind of interesting. Well, there's a big, there, there are caveats with this too. And like I say, I'm, I won't get into every caveat, but there is one with this. And just in case people would know individuals who might, <clears throat> who might uh, fall into this category. One other caveat with all of the screening is if a person does not have another medical condition which would make treatment for them to lung cancer impossible. In other words, let's say they have some horrible kidney disease and would not be able to tolerate, a, a, you know, the chemotherapy, then really it doesn't make sense to screen those people, you know. And, um, and that, again, is, you know, sort of little caveats that go along with this, you know. Blood pressure screening, a little bit more of something which is commonly acknowledged, you know. And again, this is a big difference between screening, like I alluded to before, and people who have blood pressure problems. You know, if you have a blood pressure problem, you're on medication, uh, there are guidelines, but there are a lot more that you just talk with your, you know, physician, primary care provider regarding when the follow-up, et cetera, would be. But again, these are individuals who really have no known blood pressure problems, et cetera. Every two years, if normal, every two years, probably starting even in the 20s. I mean, again, it's I'm shocked as to how many young people, and again, maybe it's a, because I see all women, but I'm shocked as to how many young women have blood pressure problems. I mean, so every two years, if normal, and there are normal ranges. Uh, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that right now. Classically, in other words, for the longest time, we've talked about a normal blood pressure upper level or systolic of less than 140, One, or less than 160, excuse me. Even 140 to 160 has been considered borderline, if you will, for, for decades. And the bottom number, the benchmark, has always been 90. Well, they've changed that a little bit, and they changed it for a very interesting reason. They changed it, like I say, some of these things evolve over time. Well, with improved blood pressure control, especially since the 1970s, we actually, we think that that has contributed some to a decreased rate of heart disease, which we have seen. But interestingly enough, the rates of stroke have either not decreased or they've actually slightly increased in that same time frame, despite better blood, 
you know, blood pressure control. And so they looked at that and said, you know, people research this, you know, in organizations, you know, university settings. And so new guidelines have come out and 140 over 90 is still sort of your benchmark for high blood pressure. But there's a big recognition now of what they call borderline or pre-hypertension, they call it. And that's at that bottom number in particular between 85 and 90. And even with that said, the, the, I, the, the recommendation is to have your blood pressure less than 90. But the ideal is to have that bottom number less than 80 and the top number less than 120. At those levels, they see almost no heart disease, you know, if other things are controlled, and minimal, minimal strokes. There are, there are all sorts of strokes. I mean, some individuals, it's not blood pressure or cholesterol related. That's a different thing, but, but that's how those new guidelines came about. Uh, so blood pressure screening is, is, is very important and it kind of goes along if, you know, to prevent high blood pressure. Some of the things, you know, I always like to say to a certain extent we're a captive of our genes. <laughs> I mean, I have taken care of personally marathon runners who really do watch their diet, vegetarian marathon runners with high blood pressure. You talk to them, well, their dad had high blood pressure, their mom, their, so we are a captive of our genes to a point. However, for a lot of people, I've also seen people who drink excessively or overweight, et cetera, stop all that, with no medicine, their blood pressures have normalized. So, so you know, that it definitely is something you, you know, want to be aware of. And blood pressures now are just, again, they're almost like, don't smoke. <laughs> We've heard about it, you know, almost ad nauseum for, for decades, you know. Diabetes screening. <clears throat> Start. The recommend, and again, we always keep in mind, I'm talking about people with no known risk factors, essentially not a strong family history, maybe just your average person with just you know, no, known, no known increased reasons to have risk. The recommended age to start uh, diabetes screening is age 45. And that screening uh, is, is generally with a fasting blood sugar. Uh, there's other tests available for diabetes, but the actual screening really, uh, your down and dirty basic screening is still a fasting blood sugar. And uh, looking at that, if it's normal, repeating that every three years. And uh, the benchmark for that now is a fasting blood, su blood sugar of, on two occasions of 124 or higher is considered diabetes. And then there's other testing they do on top of that, but. But if the blood, blood, fasting blood sugars are normal at age 45, it still is recommended every three-year screening. And that's a doesn't have to be some horrible two or three-day fast like they used to talk about. You know, it's I mean you're usually looking at an eight eight to 12-hour fast, even six hours is probably overnight. In other words, you know, is uh, is usually sufficient. <clears throat> now we're getting into something which is. Uh, you know, more of a lot of what I, I do on a regular basis. Uh, and it's something which is, you know, it's come to the forefront because of the prevalence. One in nine women right now in the U.S. And in, when we talk about the U.S., we really sort of mean Western society too. We're including Canada, the U.S., you know, Great Britain, you know, Westernized societies. One in nine women will, in fact, get breast cancer. You know, the flip side of that with, for the men is, is very interesting because it's actually more prevalent. One in six men get prostate cancer. And that's one in six men at a younger age. Because at age 100, all men have prostate cancer. It's, it's like a given. It's not going to kill them, but they all have prostate cancer. That was a study. And how they, how they actually talked these guys into having random prostate biopsies, I've never known. <laughs> but they actually did. And they... Uh, and yeah, they, they found it was like 99 point something percent of all men in that study between 100, I think it was 104 or something, they all had some stage of prostate cancer. It was pretty amazing. Obviously, it didn't do them any harm, I guess. But, but with women, one in nine, and that's, uh, and the thing, of, especially with that, is it's not a benign, as benign, if you will. I mean, prostate cancer be, can be pretty virulent too, but, pro, but breast cancer is not quite that indolent or benign. Breast cancer is very, very nasty, serious, especially if it, well, at any age, but, it, you know, but it, and the younger women who catch it get breast cancer usually have worse prognosis. They have, you know, just a more, it's almost a different subset of disease, if you will. Um, 
because it's just usually is much more aggressive. So breast cancer screening is, 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 very, is very important. And the initial part of breast cancer screening is just, I'm not sure, I don't think that's going to show up very well. On the dark it does. It's just what we call nowadays, we used to call them breast self-exams. That's kind of fallen out of favor. We call it breast self-awareness. And uh, again, there's controversy with this. There's, there are studies that show, ah, and there are even some countries that say, ah, breast, breast self-exams are useless. You know? I, I, and, but in the U.S., we, we question that. We, we still do. But now we call it breast self-awareness. We, we, we want it to start in, in the teenagers. And what that means is that you, you're aware of the texture of your individual breast. So if any, you don't have to be... You don't have to say, oh, gosh, this is abnormal. What you're looking at is trying to find a change. You find a change from your monthly or every other month exam. This is something you need to bring to the attention of a health care provider. Um, and that's breast self-awareness. And that's, again, recommended from teenagers on clinical breast exams. We used to call them physician breast exams, but there are a number of non-physician providers who provide primary care now, nurse practitioners, physician's assistants. Um, and so now they're called clinical breast exams. And a clinical breast exam is that. It's an exam by a provider on a yearly basis. And that's in addition, we'll go into about the mammogram. And there, that is, again, uh, you know, 10% of, even with, even with modern technology, 10% of breast cancers are missed on mammogram. And uh, we would hope that this would pick up some. And that's, a, and that's between starting at age 20 and going up to age 39. What that means is that in and of itself is the recommended screening now. Mammograms, not, not at that point. And there's a reason for that. Mammograms, and, and again, this varies. I mean, you have a relative, you know, a sister who had breast cancer onset at age 29. Well, you're going to probably start getting mammograms about age 24 or 25. But again, this is not that category. And the reason is, is that in a young, because I have younger women ask me this all the time, especially when they're, you know, like in maybe 30, 32. The questions usually start then. I'd like to get a mammogram now. And we did, for years, even recommend a baseline mammogram, if you will, at age 36. We've sort of gotten away from that. And the reason is, is because the mammograms at that age, the breast tissue is just so dense, the denser consistency, and it's harder to interpret the mammograms. And what the fear is, is that there's what we call false positives. In other words, if something that the radiologist sees, thinks it might be benign, but isn't sure, well, so these women end up with an unnecessary biopsy. And there's a higher frequency of that, you know, especially before the age of 40. Now, the actual yearly mammograms, here there's a big controversy. <laughs> it's an extremely big controversy, really. And, it, and I mean, we're talking government regulations say one thing, or government suggestions, I should say. Uh, professional organizations say another thing. Individual practitioners say another thing and come by. And where the controversy comes is when do yearly mam when are yearly mammograms suggested? And the big controversy is is basically the, the most most the most organizations who really have looked into this recommend without any question there should be a yearly mammogram after starting at age 50. And uh, there's a time frame where that you know that goes goes up to, and some of that depends on, you know, on, again, uh, depends on past history, et cetera. But at least up to age, you know, somewhere between 70 to 75 yearly mammograms after age 50. Our own government, however, won't pay for them, but every other year, <laughs> as my understanding with Medicare, which is very ironic. But However, even with that said, that's to me almost like the blood pressure thing. What's the minimum you're going to look for versus maybe more the ideal? As an everyday practitioner, I see a lot of women with breast cancer in their 40s. It's sad but true. I see, and I'll get through colon later too, but I see colon cancer with a lot of individuals in the 40s too. So there are recommendations, really, and there are actually recommendations from various organizations to start yearly mammograms at age 40. And a lot of people sort of go between the two and will say, 
every other year through the 40s, 50 and above, at least till the mid 70s. Some people would even say 80 yearly. So there is some controversy, but those those are sort of the uh, those are sort of the guidelines that we can go go with. Here's another thing that's near and dear to my heart: Pap smears, obviously. I mean, uh, the pap smear is very interesting. There's, there's a doctor, there's a pathologist, actually. He's a Greek guy, actually. Dr. Papenklau was his name. And uh, Dr. Papenklau, uh, probably every woman in the world knows Dr. <laughs> I should venerate Dr. Papenklau. I mean, cervical cancer in the United States, prior to the regular use of the pap smear, which was probably starting in the 50s, was the most common female cancer in the United States. Right now, it's about the seventh most common. And that's in no small measure because of the pap smear. This fellow, Pap and Clow, and he had a partner who, who is not recognized. Anyway, they actually, their first research and papers were actually in 1928. <laughs> and then the pap smear itself became regularly used for screening starting in, oh, probably starting in the 50s, you know, maybe the late, late 40s even. But, and it, it's, it's an amazing thing. And it's been changed over the years, and some of those changes are good. Some of them we question. Um, there's some of the changes have talked about less frequent pap smears. And, you know, I have a colleague here in town, uh, one, of, uh, one of the other OBGYNs, and she has actually done work in Africa on numerous occasions over the last five years. And it's very interesting to talk to her because cervical cancer is very common still there. And cervical cancer is a hideous cancer. It's horrible. I mean, it's absolutely horrible. I mean, uh, the pockets of high prevalence of their, I mean, there are wards in Vietnam of women just dying from cervical cancer. I mean, it's a horrible, it's a horrible cancer. And this, my colleague's contention is, even though we try to do what we call evidence-based medicine, She's like, you know, after spending time in Africa, I really question, do we, should we stop doing yearly pap smear? <laughs> because it's just such a hideous disease. And there are, there's, there's various uh, diet, you know, there's various caveats with that. I mean, you know, are people responsible for their own health? Are they intelligent? Is screening available, et cetera, et cetera, it goes on and on. But, you know, the modern, the modern recommendations, I personally think for most intelligent people, Maybe uh, most people who have access to pap smears and they utilize that are a little bit more reasonable. And, and some of the recommendations that have changed actually have, done, have changed for a good reason. And a lot of the changes, and I'll go into this too, are based on our knowledge, not so much of pap smears, but our knowledge now, better knowledge of a virus called a HPV or human papillomavirus. That has really changed, revolutionized since probably in the last, just we're talking here, just the last decade or 15 years has really changed how we look at pap smears. And some of that does make a lot of sense. So what are the guidelines now? You know, no more, we, we've gone the whole gamut with that over years. I myself have practiced long enough to have seen some of it. First time, you know, first sexual activity, you get pap smear within a year and this and that. Well, no longer. Um, the first pap smear now is suggested at age 21. And uh, forget anything else. We're not talking about, you know, sexual history, age 21. And there's a couple of good reasons for that. And this is one that I do agree with. Uh, and a lot of it has to do with that HPV. This HPV virus is a sexually transmitted virus. Um, but for those who may not know it, it's unbelievably and I will say again, unbelievably prevalent in Western society. In between the ages of 20 and 45, which they kind of say are the peak sexual activity years, if you will, there are some estimates that say men and women, both 80% have the HPV virus. So, I mean, you know, you almost can't get away from it. So we need to be very careful with that. We don't want to, again, what I'm getting at is we don't want to overtreat. And that's what was happening with teenagers. We found out a couple of things. Teenagers would contract the HPV virus, and the HPV virus would cause an abnormal pap smear. But if you watch those individuals long enough, usually within two years, their body's immune system smacks the virus down 
And even if they had a pap smear abnormality of severe de degree in teenagers, the, the well over 90%, well, 90% will actually normalize over two years. And so these individuals were being over-treated. I mean, some of the treatments, too, they were damaging their cervix, making childbearing and, you know, difficult, not impossible, but adding complications. And that's how this, that's how some of this came about, was were from good studies, this, you know, this part of it. So 21, first pap smear. And then through the 20s, basically, pap smears every two years. Because if, granted, if it's, if it's normal. <clears throat> now, if a person has an abnormal pap smear in the 20s, you may, depending on the abnormality, you may not treat it, but you may ask them to have a yearly pap smear. Because a lot of those abnormalities that we do see related to that HPV virus in the 20s will go away within two years. So, but these are basic guidelines. Every two years from 20, 21 to 29, after age 30, and now if they've had three normal PAPs in a row, basically through the 20s, again, we got a little variation there, but every three to five years, somewhere in there. Again, five years has just recently started coming about. I'm with my colleague who's traveled to Africa <laughs> on this. My God, I, five years is too far, too long for me. I mean, I mean, you got normal pap smears, but let's face it, this is modern society. People get divorced. They have new sexual partners, primarily is what we're seeing. I mean, I myself have seen women who are 50 who have new HPV and new <laughs> abnormalities. And these are people who would have qualified probably under some of these guidelines. So three years, I think, is reasonable for a lot of those individuals. But every five, I think you're starting to push it a little bit. Um, and then when do you stop this sort of stuff, you know? Well, pap smears, we say we could stop at age 65 to 70 if all norm, if they've had all normal paps for the previous 10 years. So again, you, again, these guidelines vary. Let's say you have somebody who's 70, and I do see people like this. They last pap smear was when they were 35 years old. They should probably still have a couple of pap smears, you know. So, but that's these are the general guidelines again. Now, what do you do with people who have been treated? You know, I've been talking about normal, normal, but when it comes to PAPS, I will, I will elaborate a little bit more because there are so many individuals who have been treated, especially for the precancer, so-called dysplasia. So the guidelines have been worked out for that too. If a person has had treatment for actual cervical cancer or some of those especially more severe precancerous changes, even those individuals, if they've gone 20 years with all normal pap smears, you can probably stop doing the pap smear. Now, one other thing of confusion that I will say here, and I didn't, it was very interesting. I, it wasn't in the reading that I did. I was sort of surprised that they didn't bring this up. And I think they didn't bring it up because it's not the best way to screen for it. But when we're talking about pap smears, we're talking about that pap smear part of the pelvic exam. The actual pelvic exam, which in my mind even includes, you know, further north, the breast exam, clinical breast exam, the examination of what we we'll call a bimanual, where the uterus, the tubes, the ovaries, and sometimes a rectal exam included in that too. Those should still be yearly in most in the, in most individuals, you know, at least after the age of 30, 30 to 35. And what we're looking for there, and again, I. I think there aren't really real good, good guidelines because unfortunately it's not the best way to screen for it, but looking especially for ovarian cancer. And unfortunately there is no good screen for ovarian cancer. There essentially is not a screen for ovarian cancer. The best we have is that, that, you know, help. And I'll take questions at the end, if you don't mind. Yeah. Because otherwise it's just going to get disjointed. But I'll remember, yeah. <laughs> So we talked about that HPV. Well, the HPV can be incorporated. The actual test for the HPV can be incorporated into pap smear screening too. Let's say you have an individual, maybe they had one or two pap smears, maybe just one in their 20s, and yet they don't want to necessarily get a lot of pap smears. They're 30 years old. So there are some criteria that if if you do a pap smear, single pap smear, and an HPV test on a woman 30 and over, and if they're both negative, you can also let that woman go the every three to five year route. So, so 
Let's talk a little bit about breast, cold, breast ovary, tubal, or what's something called primary peritoneal cancer. And this is not a general screening. In other words, this, this is a little different also than what I've been saying. In other words, this isn't, again, Jane Smith, who has never had a family member with over any of these afflictions. This is for people who have a very suspicious family history. And there are some, and what, what these are, these are blood tests. They're called the BRCA genes, BRCA1 and BRCA2. Um, not everybody wants to have them if they don't need them, not the least of which they're extremely expensive. And without an indication, most insurance companies won't pay for it. And, uh, but if there are indications, for example, let's say you have a male in your family who's had breast cancer. That's an automatic, automatic indication to get those, those relatives, you know, their progeny, let's say their kids, should get BRCA tested. You know, numerous female first order relatives, especially, you know, sisters, moms, maternal grandmothers, who have had early onset of these, especially early meaning, especially before the age of 50. But it's actually even more, a little bit more liberal than that. In about before the age 64 is the magic number. You know, you have women who are 69, 70, 75. Unfortunately, in our society, cancers just become more prevalent then. A third of us are gonna get cancer in that time frame. So that isn't necessarily genetic. And the majority of breast cancers in this day and age, in that one in nine women, are not genetic. They're actually just random, you know. One in nine is pretty common, so there's got to be something we're doing. Obviously, my impression is diet or environment. There's got to be something going on, but it's not genetics necessarily. But in those individuals who do have a family history, here being a little bit more selective, these tests are available. Uh, there's only one company in the entire world that makes them, of all things. They've got a monopoly. Is one reason they're so expensive. It's called Myriad. But to their credit, I will say they put a lot of time, money, and effort into making these tests. And they also have a very, very good mechanism worked out to screen if you qualify. They have sheets of paper. You send it in. Your doctor sends them in. And if you qualify, they help you through the whole process of this, mind you. Then the insurance companies do usually pay for this. You know, I just recently had two individuals who have had bracket testing, and they both qualified, one of whom had a male with breast cancer in their family of all things. And he was their father, actually. So, so colorectal screening. Colon cancer right now is the most common cancer in the United States, men and women both. And uh, so this is a very important. And again, you know, how do you screen for colon cancer? And, Again, this varies tremendously, again, with family history and various medical afflictions, you know. Uh, but for, again, a general individual, initial colonoscopy uh, would be at age 50. You know, there are studies that are, colonoscopy means us looking at the entire colon with a scope, called an endoscope. Uh, <clears throat> now, there are things be a little short of that. There's sigmoidoscopy, which is looking at the lower portion. There's microscopic blood testing of the stool. And they all have a role in this. But really the gold standard, if you're going to really screen for colon cancer now, age 50 is a colonoscopy. I don't know if everybody in this room has had one. I've had two. A colonoscopy is no big deal. <laughs> it's the preparation. It's miserable. It's horrible. Uh, I have an interest, a funny story with that. The first colonoscopy I had was with a gastroenterologist I knew in, in Great Falls, Montana. And, and uh, after it was all said and done, he says, yeah, what did you think about that prep, Mark? And I said, oh, man, it was horrible. He goes, yeah, it's like drinking swamp water. And all I could think of, I asked him, I said, well, Craig, how do you know what swamp water tastes like? <laughs> I mean, you know, I mean, but it's, uh, oh, my gosh, it's horrible, you know. But I have to tell you, it is an important uh, screen. And the good news is if it's normal, if you're screening, screen is normal age 50, um, and if you don't have some, un, un, you know, some unbelievably strong family history, generally speaking, most people would just recommend repeating every 10 years. And then again, stopping at age 70. So if age 50, you might end up getting, you know, three in your life. So, you know, and then um, also this fecal occult blood testing, um, there's varying uh, recommendations for that. It's, 
it, it, this is actually, interestingly enough, this is actually not a bad means of screening for colon cancer, for screening for problems. But the thing is, is it's got to be done. What, what the magic number is, is somewhere between five to seven samples, which you can do. But again, it's very interesting that insurance companies don't pay for that. <laughs> they don't pay for a screening use of a, a cold blood test. And they're, they're, not, they're not cheap. I mean, you know, <clears throat> but anyway, but if you get, if you do like five of these, you know, the patient comes in, they maybe have an exam, get a rectal in their, in their doctor's office, they get a test there, and then they get sent home with these cards. And, you know, maybe another three or four of them. That is not a bad means of screening, but it's, it's you know, a little bit uh, burdensome, and, you know, then it has to be mailed back to the office in a timely fashion. They have to be kept in a plastic bag in a refrigerator before they're mailed back. back. So there's, you know, and if not mailed back, really, you got to, ideally, if you don't trust the U.S. mail, you want to bring them in. <laughs> so, uh, but, you know, if you do a number of those, they, they are actually not a bad means of screening, too. And some people will use this sort of between, like, let's say somebody's gone five years after a normal colonoscopy or four years three, maybe even, then you might say, and the doctor might say, well, let's do what I call blood tests too in the, in the interim, you know, so. Hepatitis C screening, not something that maybe a lot of us think about. This was another thing that surprised me, and I have to say, I have to sort of look into this a little bit more. I, I didn't, uh, they recommend a baseline hep C test for all people if they were born between 1945 and 1965. Uh, it's kind of interesting to me. I, I'd never heard of this before. Um, but these are uh, going by fairly recent recommendations from, you know, various agencies. Uh, <clears throat> frequent rechecks in people with known risk factors. In other words, these are active drug users, active, active AIDS patients. Uh, when I say drug users, too, I mean needle drugs. You know? uh, some of this... 45 to 65 is, um, there's a time frame when hepatitis C was not, there was no screen for it for blood products. And then the actual hepatitis C screening for blood products has only come about since about in sometime in the 90s. So, and I, I do, I've known individuals, I know one individual in this town who had the unfortunate happenstance of getting a blood transfusion in the late 80s for a justifiable reason and contracted hepatitis C and has actually now had a liver transplant already because of the sequela of that. Um, and that's sad. Hemophiliacs, my gosh, they're in the, they're, they're in, the incidence of hepatitis C and hemophiliacs, you know, before the screening was available was, was pretty close to about 100%. I mean, these are people that uh, obviously didn't ask for it, so it's sort of sad really, but, but this was a recommendation for hepatitis. That's a blood test, mind you. Hepatitis C is a, is a blood test. It's a pretty simple blood test, really. And I think if you do not have risk factors and that initial test is negative, you probably don't need to be screened, you know, again, unless maybe you do have, even nowadays, every once in a while, there are fail, but, you know, you do contract this with blood transfusions, but it's, it's very, very, it's like one in, oh gosh, I think that's one in, 50,000, 20,000, something like that with blood transfusions nowadays because of the screening. Maybe it's more prevalent, but it's not very prevalent. Osteoporosis screening, very, uh, something that's, again, kind of near and dear to a lot of people, to me. Uh, the baseline DEXA SAN across the board, now again, is recommended between age, start, you know, baseline at age 65 for women and 70 for men. I did, you know, throw men in here too. And again, there's there's variations on this. If the DEXA scan is normal, then the, then a rescan every three to five years. Most people would go with every three years, you know, in this in this age bracket. So, <coughs> and osteoporosis is another one of these things. It's like blood pressure. It's it's a silent killer. I mean, it it kills kills people. I mean, they break the hip. Other things happen. They're not mobile. They get a blood clot that goes to their lungs. These are, and it can all be attributable, really, to the osteoporosis. There's an orthopedic doctor in town uh, here uh, who really is very knowledgeable about this, actually gave a very good presentation, which I think was open to the public just uh, in May. 
Actually, her name is Dr. Boucher, very uh, knowledgeable about this and has sort of taken on this as a real issue, which is commendable for her, really. Uh, sexually transmitted infections, uh, again, these names change, you know. Uh, we used to call it VD, venereal disease. Then for the longest time, it was STD, sexually transmitted disease. Now they're called sexually transmitted infections. They're all the same thing. I mean, and there's a ton of them. Uh, what we're primarily talking about here, though, I will say, is gonorrhea and chlamydia. And of those two, mostly chlamydia. And uh, it's, you know, we, you know, a yearly screen in women until age 25. And there's a difference here between the pap smear and the screening. And this is an important differentiation for teenagers, you know. So, because teenagers, they they're going to be they're going to be real nervous. You know, they're not going to be you know pap smear and a speculum and all this. They they may not know it at all what it is, but they're they've heard stories and they're horribly frightened by it. And yet, teenagers really they have the highest chlamydia rates going. Alaska is a hotbed of that. Alaska teens they're they're about well above the national average for chlamydia. Luckily, they don't have to have a pelvic exam to get that screen. There's actually urine testing available. Uh, and uh, that's been a real boon. And it's actually very sensitive urine testing, too, as are the actual cultures that we obtain. They're not cultures anymore. They rarely are cultures. They're actually looking for the DNA or the RNA of the chlamydia organism. They're extremely sensitive. As a matter of fact, they're almost too sensitive. Because <laughs> if you do what we call a test of cure within a month of treatment, that test may still be positive. You have to, you have to wait a month. Because even though the organisms are dead, their DNA is still hanging around, dead. They're not infectious anymore, but the particles are still there in the cervix. So if you screen too soon, let's say somebody gets treatment, they get a chlamydia retest in two weeks, they're probably still going to be positive. And then that just gives rise to a lot of being upset and you know nervousness. And in reality, they're probably already negative because chlamydia treatment you know, is very, very effective. But the, but the screening is very important. And up until age 25, and these are, some of these are statistical cutoffs. In other words, like here, you know, in women who have new sexual partners or multiple sexual partners, they should probably get yearly screens while that activity is going on. Or if they have a new partner, you know, that year, they should, you know, let's say they're 32, divorced, new partner, they should probably get a, a chlamydia. It's not, unlike, it's not unreasonable to get a chlamydia screen. But, you know, for otherwise, though, after age 25, the, the risk dramatically falls off. And like I say, some of these, are, these guidelines are statistic cutoffs. Now, if it happens to you, it's 100%. So that's the, quite, that's the problem with some statistics, you know. There's two ways to go about a lot of this. There's an individual approach, and there's what we call a public health approach. And that, I will say, most all these guidelines really, for the most part, are based on what we call the public health approach. And there's arguments about that. Some people say, well, you know, it's just to save everybody money. And, well, money is a reality. <laughs> you know, it's, there, we do have to take that into consideration. It's just, it's just a reality. So, but, you know, like I say, and the, way, the reason I say that, too, is, for example, pap smears. My, nas my national organization, the American Academy of OBGYN, they went pretty strict with these pap smear guidelines up until about three years ago when they were getting enough complaints. Because, you know, and I even in my practice will get this. I'll have women come in, intelligent women, and say, I know what the guidelines are, but I feel more comfortable getting a pap smear every year. ACOG recognizes that now. And they actually say, these are the guidelines. One of their guidelines, interest enough, is patient choice. So if, you know, and that can be true for a lot of this. I mean, a lot of that changes if you have to pay for it yourself, though, you know, if, if, they, if an insurance company latches on to those guidelines, you know, then it's then that takes on. That's a whole different, a whole different topic. But you know, these are the guidelines. And you know, regular screenings to establish the baseline, monitor health. Screenings do help to maintain health. They're well proven. Uh, and uh, and yet, if you notice, this was the sort of the second part of my talk. <laughs> the first part was the common sense approach that we all need to maintain. We don't want to depend on screening. I mean, we do want to do the screening, but really depending on it, no. 
we want to live a healthy lifestyle and we want to be proactive, you know, for our own health. And even if we've had things happen, um, you know, to us, you know, heart attack, stroke, um, you know, you don't want to, you want to prevent the second one. So, you know, you, you need to move on from there. So, and uh, I think that's it. So, and then the only other thing I will say is that, again, I've outlined those handouts do actually have a pretty good outline, actually. And, and the one is general health maintenance, which goes into a lot of the screening. And then the second part of that is the immunization. So, I promise, Jeff. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, very good question, actually, very good question, yeah, uh, yeah, I will. The question is, if a woman has had a complete hysterectomy, do they need pap smears? And that's actually a very good question for a couple of reasons. Uh, if the pap smear was, or excuse me, if the hysterectomy was performed for what we call benign reasons, let's say fibroids or heavy bleeding, you know, fibroids are benign growths of the uterus. Uh, <clears throat> endometriosis, these are non-cancerous or non-precancerous reasons, then no, no hysterectomy, or no uh, pap ever again. As a matter of fact, it's very interesting when you talk about these false positives, you do a pap smear, there's a higher risk to get one of these false positives from doing a pap smear from the top of the vagina. And then that leads to, again, unnecessary worry and tests and, and actually maybe even unsafe treatments, you know. Um, so your the answer to that question is the recommendation is no. And I, I touched a little bit on that with the cervical cancer, if you actually had cancer. And when I said for precancerous, you're looking at what we call severe dysplasias. There, again, if you remember, they said if you've gone 20 years with normal pap smears, Anything to stop in that instance too. So after hysterectomy. You were talking about the group of people who told the blood test that this year you would have done it instead of no, I no, I can't, I don't know about it. <laughs> yeah, I don't actually. Yeah. It's probably just the amplification of these other ones though, and but uh, I would assume I would assume it's probably again most of those tests, there's been several generations of them, they've always, they actually are good, but the number of ones you have to get, and that one I'm not acquainted with, actually. Sorry. Uh-huh. 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 Sure. Sure. Okay, well, a granulosa cell tumor, is, 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 is that you that said that? Yeah, that's as you probably know. When we talk about ovarian cancer, there's actually two major, there's, there's several categories of ovarian cancer, there's two major ones. The, you know, there's one that's the most common and sort of the deadliest, if you will, are what we call epithelial ovarian cancers. And the one that this lady's referring to is the second category called germ cell tumors. Germ cell tumors occur at a younger age. They're usually not as bad they're at prognosis, but they sure can be, you know. And, uh, you know, it, it's very interesting. They've changed that recently as far as pap smears go. Not, a, not necessarily exams, but pap smears. They've actually, they've actually dropped the recommendation of, fo of following pap smears on a yearly basis for ovarian cancer. That's fairly recent, probably within the last couple of years. Um, they just didn't find it was really being helpful. You know, once you've had the history to get that pap smear, they just didn't find it to be helpful. And that endometrial cancer as well. Um, so the exam with that on a yearly basis is always going to be important because you can still, especially with that, because that is less likely to be as virulent as the other ones. And if you feel some bumps, you know, in the vagina, that would be important. I'm not aware of what the serum testing would be for that, because there are markers for that, whether they follow those periodically. Generally speaking, I would say after 20 years, though, you're, you're probably, with that type of tumor, you're probably in pretty good stead. Anything, most of them over 10 years, 
are good. And the breast and the ovary, I mean, those are usually considered to be good. Although, even with that said, I, there's a colleague uh, down in Montana, a woman who, what was she, a month before or a month after her 10 year anniversary, she recurred with breast cancer. And uh, eventually killed her, too. I mean, you know, so. You know, I don't think with the germ cell tumors. Yeah. No, the, those, the BRCA testing is my recollection from what I see. That's that epithelial cell. They're called serous or mucinous, uh, endometrioid types. I don't think with the germ cells. I think that's a different animal. So I don't think it does. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, very much so. Very much so. A lot of, I think some of the a lot of the African countries are that way, you know. Um, and you know, there's other countries where it's more prevalent, you know. But generally, generally, breast cancer is more common in your Western societies. And that's why that's why people think it's meaning Canada, the U.S., Great Britain, France, you know, developed countries, you know. Um, that's why they think it's probably a matter of environment and that, although <laughs> some of those undeveloped countries don't have a lot of breast cancer, but their average age span for even the women is still lower than, you know, because of other things, you know, infectious disease in particular, you know, you know, we still live in a bubble here. I mean, infections kill more people on a, you know, worldwide basis than, you know, parasitic infections and things like that, you know. And other things, you know, like some of the other cancers, like cervical cancer. Cervical cancer is, in some ways, is an infectious disease, actually, because it's an HPV. It's caused by a virus, you know. Um, and that's that's how they, you know, that's how a lot of these guidelines for the pap smears were changed, is because a better understanding, not of pap smears and pathology, but of the HPV virus and its natural history, and, and that our immune systems, your immune systems, actually keep that virus down. And yet there's certain things that we don't quite know and that are very interesting. Like, for example, our immune systems naturally begin to wane a little bit when we're older. So let's say you had the HPV and for years your immune system kept it under check and here you're 70 and so you don't have to get pap smears anymore. Well, <laughs> what if your immune system is waning when you're 82? You know, so I don't know. And some of these are unknown. I mean, you know, some people have looked at this, but some of it is still in evolution, you know. Uh, so, but there are, to answer your question, there are, I don't know specifics, although I will know generality that actually non-developed countries usually have lower incidences of breast cancer, I believe. So. You know why the incidence of the cancer is down after After what? Oh, yeah, it's just, no, it doesn't go down. It's just that you, if you're going to get it, you're going to get it by then usually. It doesn't go away. But it's just that the most common time frame is going to be before that. I mean, we all know people who, who live to be 100, or if you don't know them, you read about them, who die of falling off a step. I mean, you know, they have no cancer. They have no heart disease. So that, in other words, you know, there's going to be, you know, the majority of people, you know, are going to, everybody's going to die of something, right? But that's another one of those statistical cutoffs. It's not like you, it's just that those are people for some reason just aren't prone to it. And some of that, we don't know why they're not prone to it. Sometimes we do. I mean, there's inklings as to, in general, with colon cancer, there's really, really, it's really thought that there's, you know, dietary, probably dietary connections with colon cancer. I mean, I think, you know, you'd have to acknowledge that, you know, because again, it's a, it's, it is a true disease of Western developed society. Um, and I can give you a couple of references if you want to read. I, I didn't include them, but I'll give you two references if you're interested in things like colon cancer and general cancer and other things too, things like rheumatoid arthritis, gout, interestingly enough. There's two, there's two books that I would recommend to read. Uh, one is called The China Study, and one is called Prevent and Reverse Heart Disease. You can get them both. The China Study is actually probably a little bit more popular. Prevent and reverse heart disease got a little popular because the doctor who wrote that, Esselstein, treated Bill Clinton. That's who treated Clinton after his bypass surgery several years ago. And 
But both of those books are, are very good books. Um, Prevent and Reverse is a very quick quick read. It's probably 150 pages, half the books are cookbook. <laughs> I mean, and they're not diets. It's not like the Atkins diet or anything. These are just these are just very good references as to you know a different way of eating, a different way of even preparing food. And then uh, that China study is uh, is kind of an interesting book. I there's parts of the China study I don't necessarily believe. My wife believes in all of it. <laughs> I don't believe in parts of the China study. Prevent and reverse heart disease, I have to say, I probably believe in that entire book. So, but those are good references, you know, if you want to do further reading. Oh, osteopenia? Sure. Yeah. No, osteopenia is, is you know, a thinning of the bones, you know, a layperson's term, it's, it's thin bone. And it is thought to be, you know, a risk factor for developing osteoporosis. So you don't want to ignore osteopenia. And uh, I always have to look them up. I mean, they, they have T-scores, and those, they had Z-scores for a while. Um, but if you have osteopenia, you treat it different than you treat osteoporosis. And there's... Some, some people advocate more aggressive treatment of osteopenia even. But generally speaking, the, you know, osteopenia can be treated a little less aggressively, possibly still a role for calcium and vitamin D. And this sort of changes too. There's been questioning about the calcium that should, you know, a maximum you should take. Generally speaking, at a minimum, if you have osteopenia, you should probably be taking calcium somewhere between two and 5,000 milligrams a day um, and vitamin D probably, you know, again, like 2,000, you know. Now, the probably the calcium, I would have to say more 1,500 to 2,000, quite frankly. Uh, that 5,000 is a lot. Now, there's been studies recently that have questioned that about how much calcium. But, I mean, if you have osteopenia, if you don't have osteopenia for general, you know, probably 1,000 maybe milligrams a day of calcium, maybe 2,000 of vitamin D. Vitamin D deficiency is very prevalent in the, in the United States. That's a relatively new finding. It's irrespective of, it's irrespective of where you live, too. As a matter of fact, some of the studies that showed, the initial studies that showed that came out of, guess where? It wasn't Alaska. <laughs> it was Miami. Miami, Florida, of all places, where you think, oh, my God, all that sun. But there's thoughts with that, too. Number one, it's almost, we're almost, we've gotten so protective of our skin which is not a bad thing for skin cancer, but they actually think that possibly using sunscreens and clothing like we do now has actually decreased our vitamin D. So, so you know, and there's sun exposure, lymph time frames. Uh, oh gosh, I can't remember. There's actually, it's been worked out of your, how much of your body needs to be exposed on a daily basis for how many hours to naturally get vitamin D. But uh, we're looking, What's that? What's that? Oh. No, I don't know. <laughs> Maybe I, I don't remember myself. Yeah. <laughs> pretty low. That's pretty low, yeah. Yeah, and you know, there are just, one thing I will say all about a lot of websites, you got to be careful. Something like that where you plug in data, if it's from someplace like the Mayo Clinic or Cleveland Clinic, I mean, I'm, I'm actually fairly traditional with my recommendations on that, because there's a lot of garbage on the internet, and there's stuff that will unnecessarily frighten people, and, unnecess and some are even harmful. But there are good sites, too. That sounds like it's probably a, not a bad one, actually. Yeah, I was going to say that one sounds like if it gave you that, that's probably a pretty good one. But, you know, WebMD is pretty good, the Mayo Clinic, Cleveland Clinic. These are good websites, you know, that give you good information. And you, you know, you know, I don't <laughs> because, uh, you know, cal I go with just the calcium carbonate usually because it's the most available, it's the most reasonably priced, 
Now the vitamin D, mind you, though, there are there is data to show apparently that D3 is better uh, than so, but I just go with calcium carbonate myself. There's calcium gluconate, you know, and that, but I think calcium carbonate is is uh, with, with vitamin D is is absorbed enough. I don't think so. Not that I'm aware of, because the absorption, you know, is going to be is long term. I mean, it's not just, you know, I don't think the same time of day probably would be, you know, good, you know, because you know you want to just you don't want to, you know, take at different times of day. Your levels are going to be all over the place. But yeah. Anything else or? Well, it all depends when they enter the nunnery, I guess, you know, <laughs> you know, they've actually, I'll, t I'll give you another angle on that. And, you know, you know, possibly Catholic nuns aren't quite this, but they've actually, what the big question really came up a couple of years ago with us gynecologists is, do you do, do, you know, do you do pap smears on lesbians? Because, you know, it's like, you know, there's no female to female, really, there, there can be, you know, some, maybe, but, you know, it's pretty rare. It's not, it's not transmitted by, you know, sex toys, et cetera. Well, the interesting thing is, is what they did to try to answer that is they just, they just said, well, before we answer that question, let's do a screening, random, just keep screening. And they found pretty high incidences of HPV in, in lesbian women because they basically, you know, a lot of them had even occasionally still would have a, a partner prior to becoming, you know, in their orientation, they were. So uh, Catholic nuns, you know, I don't know, you know. <laughs> that I don't know, you know. I mean, you know. Now I will say, you know, like for example, uh, you know where somebody, you know how circumcisions came about, you know, was because of, of cancer risk, you know. The risk of, you know, penile cancer and being so-called clean in antiquity, that those were, there was found that, you know, because the, the smegma is, the, you know, just an area where the HPV can be harbored. It's carcinogenic. So it's pretty interesting how some of this stuff is, is discovered over, over centuries even. Uh, just nothing to do with screening, but an interesting story on that is, I'm sure, and I'm not sure about the men, but I would imagine all the women is from a part of IUDs, intrauterine devices. You know how IUDs were invented? Well, <laughs> this is very interesting in that, Back in antiquity, a camel driver somewhere, you know, somewhere in northern Africa, if their camels got pregnant on these long caravans, apparently it was just a, it was just a rodeo. I mean, it was a real mess, and the, the animals wouldn't carry what they needed to carry. They would drop their, you know, baby camels and root and, and whatnot. Somebody, I would imagine, they thought they were just going to plug up the hole. Somebody figured, well, if we stick a pebble, we stuck a pebble up in this camel's womb, and they never got pregnant. And that somehow or another came out in the literature like centuries later, and that's that's what led to IUDs. <laughs> kind of a, an interesting little story. I know. <laughs> <laughs> nothing to do with uh, nothing to do with uh, screening. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Miles. Thank you, Tiffany. Um, you want to take that off?
Well, I tell you, it's a, and, and many times they don't know the general rule of thumb. The moment that you have primary rule, you Thank you. 